let me welcome everyone uh, to the Forum for the Scottish Baronage uh, inaugural webinar and to our very special guest, uh, Peter Cairns, Executive Director of Scotland, the Big Picture. Uh, I'm Fernando gutierrez Sedi, Chair of the Forum's Board. And in alignment with the Forum's commitment to Scottish heritage, culture and heraldry, I'm especially excited to start our webinar series by looking at the issue of climate action with a focus on Scottish nature, biodiversity, and people thriving together. In that regard, who better to lead us than Peter uh, Cairns, a, conserv a, a conservationist and founder of Scotland, uh, the big picture, that is spearheading the recovery of nature across Scotland through a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach. Um, this is obviously very much in response to the growing climate and biodiversity crisis impacting Scotland, but um, throughout the world as well. Following Peter's presentation, we will open it up for a Q&A and a lively discussion. So with that, um, Peter, over to you, please. Thanks very much indeed for inviting me along this evening to tell you a little bit about our work. Uh, as Fernando says, my name is, is Peter Cairns, Pete Cairns. Um, I've been in the, I suppose, the rewilding space now for more than 25 years, um, and I'm now delighted and very proud to head up Scotland the Big Picture. We're a, a small charity. We have a core team of around about 15, 17. And as you can see from our logo, we work to support rewilding for nature, for climate, and for people. I think as Fernando was, was alluding to at the beginning, we, we all recognise that as a society, perhaps even as a species, we face some unprecedented challenges, challenges that I suppose take very little account of, of wealth or social background or, or country of, of residence. And it's against that very backdrop that Scotland the Big Picture operates, working to drive the recovery of nature across Scotland through rewilding in response to that growing climate and biodiversity crisis. So I suppose a good place to start is what is rewilding? So it is fair to say that definitions do vary, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but for us, rewilding is an evolving process of nature recovery that leads to restored ecosystem health, function, and completeness. What that means, in essence, is that we want to see hundreds of thousands of Scottish acres that presently look something like this transformed into acres that look more like this. So more trees, more flowers, more insects, more fish, more birds and mammals, and ultimately more people living healthy, fulfilling lives as part of vibrant communities. So what do we do to achieve that mission? So we have four strategic areas, four focus areas. We drive support for rewilding. We commit more land and water to rewilding. We return missing species, missing native species, and we develop rewilding business. So I'd just like to spend the next sort of 10 minutes or so walking you through those focus areas. So where we come from is effectively environmental communications. That's, that's my background and, and that of the core team at SVP. And we believe passionately in the power of storytelling to help turn the tide for nature recovery. So across our writing, our films, our events, our rewilding experiences, and across all of our practical projects, we communicate using forward-looking positive narratives to demonstrate how rewilding looks and works and the benefits that it can deliver. And this is the change that we want to see through driving support for rewilding. More people at all levels understanding the challenges relating to those crises we talked about, and how rewilding can supply can provide a solution to both. And we use various tools, a growing sort of portfolio of tools, if you like, to achieve exactly that. Over the years, we've produced a number of these high profile, high production values books like this one. I'd like to think that they've played a key role in influencing both public support and political policy around rewilding in Scotland. In this particular case, we gifted 1,500 of these books to policymakers, landowners, land managers. 
We also host a major conference every two years, bringing together a broad spectrum of, of interest groups and stakeholders. And at these conferences, obviously, people learn about best practice. There's an exchange of knowledge. There's a, a chance to make contacts. But I think for us, the headline is inspiring people about what Scotland could look like and showcasing positive rewilding stories or success stories. If you were there at the beginning of this of this webinar, there was a, a bit of a trailer uh, around a film called Riverwoods that we toured across many venues last year. That's just one example of how we use visual media in this particular case to engage a, a broad audience. So this slide really relates to the fact that it's not all about large gatherings or, or events. Knowledge exchange can also happen at a much smaller level. We do a lot of work with school children. We do a lot of work with clubs and societies and even family and friends. So that headline of driving support for rewilding spans a range of activities and a range of audiences, both in terms of size and in terms of demographic. Ultimately, you might argue that our, our core objective is to create more land and water committed to the principles of rewilding. And if I'm honest, going back to when SBP began, this was never part of our strategic objectives. We never envisaged getting involved in practical rewilding. But about three years ago, following one of our conferences, actually, we were approached by three farmers who said to us, we love this rewilding stuff. How do we do it? And if I'm honest, we were unable to offer a coherent answer. And that was really the catalyst for what has now become arguably our flagship project, which is the Northwoods Rewilding Network. And if we fast forward from over those last three years, those three farmers have now become 60, 60 land partners, spanning farms, crofts, small estates, community woodlands, e even schools. Who have all come together to commit themselves to nature recovery so it's a we've created a series of ecological stepping stones across scotland and i'm just going to introduce you to a couple of characters within the network just to demonstrate the type of work that all our land partners are involved with this is mark hamblin who lives at ballon farm just 30 minutes away from where i am today just two years ago ballon lagan was I guess you would describe it as, as pretty sterile sheep pasture, but Mark and his partner, Gail, have done unbelievable work. They've planted over 7,000 native trees. They've created a series of ponds and wetlands that, that started off looking like this, but now look like this. It's created a, an oasis for frogs, for fish, for dragonflies, for wading birds. And of course, all of this habitat restoration is locking up carbon, and in this case, reducing flood risk by making more space for water. Mark and Gail have also created or restored a, quite a significant area of wildflower meadows, of course, providing sanctuary for pollinating insects, but not only that, creating space for people to, in this case, study, but otherwise just enjoy. This is David Stewart over at Ardna Keg in, in Argyll. And like a handful of Northwoods partners, David is lucky enough to have a remnant of Scottish rainforest on his land. Now, the word Scottish and rainforest don't normally go together, but in actual fact, this temperate woodland once covered most of Scotland's west coast, and indeed Ireland's west coast, but is now confined to just isolated pockets. So by providing knowledge, and funding and ongoing support. We're working with David and others to expand this rare and unique habitat. And one of the ways that David is doing that is working with what we call surrogate herbivores. In other words, native cattle and horses to replicate the grazing patterns of lost herbivores at very, very low intensity. And what David's doing here is doing something else that many of the Northwoods partners are engaged with, which is removing fencing, taking away wildlife barriers, allowing the freedom of movement of wildlife, or in this case, cattle, which he controls with the use of what we call no fence collars, which is effectively a GPS app that controls where the cattle can go at any given time. So we can really fine tune the impact, the positive impact of grazing and avoid perhaps the negative impact of grazing. 
We now know, of course, that healthy peatlands, of which Scotland have a vast area, have the capability of storing more carbon than tropical rainforests. But 80% of Scotland's peatlands are in one way or another degraded. So the main rewilding action on peatlands is effectively re-wetting them, blocking the drains that previously took the water off the hill. And that's a core element of our rewilding work. And if we can get these natural giant sponges to function effectively, they'll soak up huge amounts of carbon and huge volumes of water. And we know it works and it works really, really quickly. Simply stopping that water drain away, drain away has an immediate effect. And I think this symbolizes in many ways that, that rewilding is not just a physical change to the land and sea, important although that is, it's actually a philosophical change, treating nature, in this case peatland, not as a commodity to be exploited, but as an ally, again, in this case, in climate breakdown. One of our core values, if you like, is risk taking. I, I don't say that to portray ourselves as, as mavericks, but we do like to think we will go where others can't or won't and that really does come into play when we're talking about returning missing native species and what we want to see effectively is greater abundance and diversity of species and for people to better understand the role of all species in healthy ecosystems and that can look very differently in different settings at a very simple level, that might mean building additional nesting capacity, in this case, breeding platforms for ospreys and eagles. And we've probably installed, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 of these over the network over the last two or three years. Or it might mean providing a receptor site for the translocation of beavers, as here at, at Argety Farm in Stirlingshire, one of our Northwoods land partners. Just going up the sort of scale of ambition, it might be something more ambitious, such as our project to return Eurasian cranes to the Cairngorms National Park for the first time in 500 years. And this is a project not only to restore uh, a missing piece to the ecological jigsaw, important as that is, but cranes can also act as ambassadors for healthy wetlands and as well as attracting visitors to rural communities. So for us, returning a species like cranes is clearly good for nature, but it also has benefits for climate and people. As I said at the beginning of this section, returning missing species provides unique challenges, and no more so when they're talking about an apex predator. And we're working with a couple of other organizations to reintroduce this animal, the Eurasian lynx. Scotland remains just one of a handful of European countries refusing to live with lynx. And it's not that we can't, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of habitat. It is that we won't, it, it's a choice. Lynx and other large predators are now spreading across mainland Europe. And we believe that the UK has a moral duty to play its part in the global effort to restore and recover our degraded living systems. And as you might imagine, it's a hot political potato. But if successful, this would be the first time the UK has ever reintroduced an apex predator. So it is a big deal. On the positive side, because there, there are challenges, there's no doubt, and we are making progress. This is an event that happened just last week, actually, at Holyrood, where we made the case for links at Scottish Parliament. And encouragingly, we now have a number of MSPs supporting this project. So it takes a while to work through. This is a major significant change in Scotland, but we are making progress. And again, just like with cranes, this is we don't see this as just a nice thing to do for nature. There are benefits to people. And you could draw an example from places in Germany, like the Harz National Park, where reintroduced links have become a major draw to visitors seeking out a, a more wilder experience. And finally, we recognize that in many situations, ecological recovery is only possible, or it's certainly easier when it works in tandem 
with local communities. So we work to develop enterprise models that reward rewilding and enable new nature-based businesses that contribute to local economies. And the change that we want to see is simply that rewilding is regarded or recognized as an economically viable land use. And again, that might look like various different things. That might mean helping our Northwoods land partners develop nature-based tourism businesses, such as this one at Balangine, which hosts a range of nature-based and rewilding experiences through the year. It might mean the development of sustainable craft businesses like this one in Argyle. It might mean the production and distribution of healthy food, encouraging a local circular economy, cutting down on food miles, keeping food local in a local circular system. And it might mean helping to promote the sustainable use of venison. And it's interesting how all of this comes around in a circle, because in the absence of natural predators like lynx, it is true to say that Scotland has a burgeoning deer population that's widely recognised and acknowledged. And of course, those deer have to be culled to restore and recover natural habitats and making use of, of what is a, a healthy, high welfare product and keeping that product in the local area for us, at least makes complete sense. So we're always very keen to promote and support sustainable venison based businesses. And finally, in this section, we're working uh, on a concept that we call wild spaces. This is a series of high quality, high sustainability wildlife hides and overnight cabins that will connect people with wild nature, but also will provide income for land managers looking to move away from perhaps more traditional land uses such as livestock, farming and hunting. We've just started rolling out a series of these structures across the Northwoods rewilding networks. It's a very new venture for us, but we're hugely excited about the potential. Everything that we do effectively points towards this. This is our vision. Our vision is of a vast network of rewilded land and water across Scotland where wildlife flourishes and people thrive. And I think that that alliance of nature and people that Fernando referred to at the beginning is really important. We worked hard to dispel the notion that rewilding has to be a choice between the needs of nature and the needs of people. And we need to come up with shared solutions that, that, create, uh, that create solutions for both. So, you know, heading up a, a rewilding organization, it is fair to say it, it can be a tough job. Re rewilding represents change. And for many people, that change is considered to be a threat to a, to, a, to a traditional way of life. And we acknowledge that and recognize that. Another challenge is that rewilding takes a lot of time. It takes many years, decades, centuries even. So it's sometimes difficult for people to relate to the best of the results will be seen far beyond our lifetimes. But despite that, rewilding is undoubtedly gaining in popularity, especially among young people. And we've done quite a lot of work to try and understand why that is the case. And ultimately, I believe that the reason that rewilding is popular, especially among young people, is that it's a story of hope. Fundamentally, Scott in the big picture trades in hope. And I think we all need that. So that's really my story. Thank you very much indeed for listening. You can recap on most of what I've said at the Scotland Big Picture website. You're very welcome to go along. You can sign up to our newsletter. We'd be delighted if you join us on our journey. And yeah, happy to answer any questions. So thanks for listening. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. That was um, quite quite a presentation. I, I love the um, the sense of optimism and, and you know, you're, touching on a lot of evidence, right? So this is not sort of just um, good feeling, but um, it's obviously researched and there's been a lot of science, which is which is great. Um, and that collaboration that, that you touched on, whether it's, uh, you know, MPs or landowners, uh, youth, et cetera, right? Because this is really such an issue that, um, you know, if you don't have the whole of society, right, um, you know, 
uh, it's going to be a, a tough deal. Um, so with that, I mean, I, I would invite any questions either in the chat or I see here there's at least on my screen, there's a reaction um, in the toolbar. Um, Jeff, yeah. Peter, um, I could identify with um, a lot of what you're saying. I live up in um, Person Kinross, just outside of Pitlochry. Um, and one of the things which was of interest to me is, of course, the beloved Scottish wildcat. Now, I, <laughs> I've seen one or two of them walking up my drive. They're about the size of a small dog, um, but they're very elusive, and you're very lucky to see them. I've seen more over in, in Foss, but they are becoming a rarity. And you see some over in Glen Isla, but they are becoming a, a rarity. I, I, I mean, what is, are you guys doing to try to protect or make that species a little bit more vibrant than what it was? Or... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question, Jeff. I, I, I don't want to be too much sort of glass half empty, but, but it's actually worse than, than a rarity. They've been declared functionally extinct which effectively means that their numbers are at a, such a critical level that they're no longer viable as a, as a population. So there are still wildcats in the landscape, but not enough to be, to be viable in the long term. So the long, the, long, the long story is a long story over wildcats. We, we've been kind of involved and, and on the edge of it for probably about 12 years now. But the latest um, story is a much more positive one, to be fair. Um, there's a project now called Saving Wildcats, which are literally in the next two weeks um, reintroducing a supplementary population of wildcats into the Cairngorms. So this is in recognition that without intervention wildcats are done for in Scotland um, and this is the first time there's been a proactive intervention to reintroduce or supplement the existing population and that's going to involve releasing around about 25 cats for the next five years if that's successful and there's no reason it shouldn't be, then that will be expanded across the, rain, the, the rest of Scotland. So it, it's they are testing times for wildcats. There's no doubt about that. But I would say that the future is probably more positive than it has been for the last 20 years. So it's a little bit of a watch this space, fingers crossed. But things, good things are, are now happening. Where I live, you get quite a lot of deer. And the deer... Uh, come into my garden a few at a time, sometimes two or three. And yet, if I go for a walk in the back hills, in the, uh, on the back end of Glenshee, or coming up from the Kilmichael side, you can actually see, depending on if you're lucky or not, literally herds of two, three, four hundred of them. Yeah. And in some ways, it, I don't know what local farmers think, but these animals, whilst they look highly attractive in a natural setting or high up on the hill, can actually become, for want of a better word, damn nuisance mm. uh, to the local farmers. And sometimes I think the concept of, you know, culling is, you know, sometimes it's, it's more of a wish than a prayer and, a, and prayer. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, we'd, we'd need probably a, another few hours to go deep into the deer situation. It's it's terribly, terribly complex. But at, at a headline level, um, deer numbers in Scotland, in fact, throughout the whole of the UK, have burgeoned. I mean, I mean we would argue that at an ecological level, you know, it, it's in the absence of natural predators, that there are reasons, specific reasons in Scotland why deer numbers are retained at a high level. Um, Right now, the government are on the brink of, of intervening and effectively putting a maximum limit on number of deer or density of deer, should we say. The, the example that you quoted actually is ironically one of two probably worst case scenarios across the whole of Scotland. That, that back end of Jet Glenshee, uh, Glendall area is, is probably the, the quintessential problem area if you like in scotland for, for red deer in particular so it, it's a it's a contentious issue uh, i won't go into the details but it is now being addressed and and i think at last at last and this has dragged on for a long 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 time 
there is a recognition within the deer management community, within the traditional estate community, that that we can't put our fingers in our ears and, and just let this situation carry on. So there is some progress towards a collaborative um, voluntary effort to reduce deer densities. But in the background, there's also a legislative framework that's about to hit home, which will force land managers to reduce deer densities. And of course, it's not about the deer, it's about the impact of the deer. And, and nobody is contesting that, that deer aren't an iconic and valuable species. Of course they are. It's just the numbers, the, the collective impact of those three or 400 that you describe. Um, forest isn't able to generate, peatland is degraded. Yeah, the list goes on. So it, it's, it's not an easy situation. There are cultural and political and economic considerations in there as well, but as with the wildcats, I think we're starting to come out the other end of it. So again, I would say it's more of a glass half full than, than empty. Very good, thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about that, um, how you collaborate with, with those landowners, right? Especially the the large ones up in the, the north of Scotland, which I think, um, I, I'm not sure you probably have the statistic, but you know, the, the the percentage of land that is in in those hands must be quite quite significant. So I suppose if you're tackling, you know, the, the issue from a from a sort of overall Scottish um, perspective, you know, their their input and their buy-in, I suppose, is is quite essential, right? It really is. Um, and again, I, I sound like a record, but but I, I see huge change even in the last twelve months. Certainly in the last three years. And I'm not saying this is the case across the board. It, it absolutely isn't. But estates that I've known of for years and years that were very much wedded to the traditions of deer stalking, farming, fishing, forestry, et cetera, are now looking at alternatives. And, and in some cases, those alternatives, if, if not rewilding, then some of the principles of rewilding. And I think it's interesting that one, one of the things that excites me about this, this space is that rewilding has moved quite quickly actually from being a I suppose a conversation that environmentalists were having not very long ago um, and now it's shifted seismically into a conversation that wider society is having because it needs to as, as you alluded to earlier on so all of a sudden there's a there's a there are shared challenges and people are starting to realize we need to look for shared solutions so I can think of probably a dozen large estates that have recently either approached us or organizations similar to us looking for some looking for some advice i suppose on the opportunities afforded by ecological change but also they're looking to the long term economic future how do we make this pay how is this estate going to remain viable in the absence of those traditional land uses such as deer stalking. So the conversation is really dynamic, it's fluid, but it's definitely going on. Whereas I think just a couple of years ago, it absolutely wasn't. And some of the estates without mentioning any names are, are pretty surprising because they're you know, historically very conservative, quite risk averse, pretty entrenched. Um, but, but in some cases, economics is forcing them to start looking at alternative ways of managing the land. So. Yeah, it's an ongoing, evolving process, but but increasingly those those stubborn corners that you thought will never budge are just starting to 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 to, to come to the table and at least have a discussion. And and our job really is is really quite difficult because of course what we're trying to do on a daily basis is is push the envelope of change, and we do that as far as we dare without alienating the very people that we need to take with us. And, and landowners and farmers are a good example of that. And that line is wafer thin <laughs> on a daily basis. If, you, if you're overly strident or maverick, um, or you're, you, you're seen to be imposing change on people, then that meets with resistance. But at the same time, we're trying to turn the dial. Um, and it, yeah, it's a thin line to walk. And I would like to think that over the years, we've, I won't say we've perfected it, but we've certainly got better at it as time's gone on. But it's its a challenge. And, and uh, you know, the battleground, if, if, if you like, for all of this stuff, it, it's not a physical change to the land and sea. It's hearts and minds. It's people and their, their values and their priorities. So the people space is really where we operate much more than the, the, the physical space, if, if you like. 
And then just from that same sort of line, um, you know, how, how do you collaborate on on sort of I don't know academic institutions, whether they they be Scottish or or outside, uh, because you you talk a lot about evidence, right? And and perhaps um, that's part of the persuasion, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about where you get that evidence, who you work with, and I mean, I suppose academic institutions would be one, but also institutions outside of Scotland, right? Because climate action and biodiversity is, is really a, a world phenomenon, right? Um, so I, I just like to know, you know, the linkages even outside of, of, of Scotland would, 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 would be interesting. Yeah. So if I just kind of zoom in on the evidence side of things, just, just to give you one example, um, we, we're working at the moment actually today, as it happens with the University of Edinburgh, who uh, effectively want to, to offset their carbon emissions and are doing so via four of our Northwoods land partners. So that's the, their carbon offsetting box is ticked. But what they do to monitor that is employ their own students on the ground to take that, but those baseline surveys and then monitor um, increased carbon lockup, biodiversity uplift, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just one example of working with a, with a learning institution. Um, University of St. Andrews, we have a, a formative relationship with, um, they had a group of students here just, just a few weeks ago. Um, and again, that's something that we want to, de to, to develop as much as anything else, because of not because they're learning institutions, but because they're young people. Um, and those young people are really um, have, a, have a healthy appetite for this, as I alluded to in the talk. Um, zooming out, um, we're part of the Scottish Rewilding Alliance. That's 26 organisations. Um, I say organisations, most of them are charities like us. Some are estates, some are private landowners, but they all have a shared interest in developing rewilding. Zooming out still further, there's an organisation called Rewilding Europe who we work with very closely. And then zooming out even further, there's a, another organization or coalition of the willing, if you like, called the Global Rewilding Alliance. And of course, um, although policies and approaches do vary across those individual organizations and across those, those different scales, generally speaking, the direction of travel is shared uh, universally. And, and actually, I find one of the really exciting things about rewilding is that pretty much everybody's singing from the same song sheet that hasn't always been the case in the traditional conservation sector um there's quite a lot of territoriality i feel in the conservation community especially in the uk but rewilding at so far and it's uh i wouldn't say it's embryonic but it's probably still in its infancy um those those sort of political and self-serving agendas haven't haven't materialized so there's a real can-do feeling in Scotland, in Europe, and then indeed in the in the in a, at a global context, which is which is hugely exciting because it allows things to get done. Simple as that. Peter, can I ask one question? And and it's relating really to the to the whole scope of the rewilding project, if you could call it that. I mean, the scope itself is quite humongous I mean, if one stands back and looks at it. So the question which is in my mind is, how do you taper that down into manageable, let's call them discrete type projects, which you can nibble away back and make a difference? Because yes. you, you can't actually try to solve everything because it's not going to work. No, ab absolutely. And and to be fair, Jeff, you know, over the years, we've got more and more, uh, I suppose, disciplined or discerning about what we take on, because you can't be everything to everybody. And you've got to recognize where your strengths are and where there are where there's greater strength working in collaboration. And we I'd like to think that we're very strategic about what we do and, and more importantly, what we don't do. Um, so absolutely. And I think what the thing we're always interested in as an individual organization is how can we how can we add value can can we bring something to this space where lots of people are operating at different scales and in different settings that nobody else can or a few others can how do we how do we optimize our impact so we are focused on what we do and although we have a 
a global perspective and we have friends and allies across the whole world in terms of what we do it's actually a it's focused on scotland obviously but it's actually quite um it's quite a small area of operation playing to our strengths and recognizing where others have have greater strengths so we're, we're absolutely not trying to be everything to everybody and we absolutely recognize that our biggest impact can be is, is on the spaces that we can control. And, and whilst the prospect of rewilding in, I don't know, Bolivia, you know, I might I might applaud that and find that commendable and, and laudable. It's not something we can get involved with. We, we have no jurisdiction there. So you do have to play to your strengths. And I, I would like to think we're pretty disciplined in in how we evaluate what we get involved with and just as importantly, what we don't. Thanks. It's difficult because, as you rightly say, you know, it, it's a humongous area, it's a humongous task, and you can very easily get pulled every which way. But as a small team, or, or as any size team, really, you, you just can't go there. You've got to be pretty disciplined in what you focus on. Very good. Thanks. First, uh, just a comment. Uh, I live in a neighborhood in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and uh, some of my neighbors uh, include a pack of coyotes. So we've seen uh, a rewilding within the, the city limits, including foxes and coyotes, uh, large fox now, uh, eagles over by White Rock Lake. And these are all things that are occurring without human intervention. The, the wild world is just coming back in. The thing that was interesting to me a moment ago, you made a comment that some of the landowners who've been most recalcitrant and been reluctant to participate have suddenly had a change of heart or over time had a change of heart. I, I'm curious to know what it was that caused the change of opinion that have had them now moving in a different direction. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, I think it's it's difficult to generalize because I think people's motivations are hugely varied. There is, there is in some case, there are in some cases um, a, a sense of civic duty, if you like, a recognition that business as usual is not acceptable, and we have to all do our bit, whatever that looks like in your particular space. In some cases, um, in Scotland anyway, there's a quite a, a a high sense of legacy, it passing on your chunk of land to the next generation in a, in a viable state or in a healthy state is seen as important. So there's one lander owner I, we're, we're talking with at the moment whose motivation is not one of environmental benevolence, but one of a sense of duty to his to his daughter in, in his particular case. And again, I think there's, there are others that are motivated by economics. They're looking 10, 15 years ahead and thinking, you know, is sheep, is sheep farming going to have a future at that time? Probably concluding no and thinking, OK, well, if you know, if I want to stay living in this this area of land, I need to do something differently. So there's a broad range of motivations. And I think the backdrop to all of that, I suppose, is is societal values changing. Climate breakdown is in the news almost every day. That's, you know, biodiversity loss is starting to catch up with that narrative. And, and I look on rewilding as a process akin to other social change that's happened over the last 30, 40 years. You might choose racism or gender equality. You know, when I was 18, it wasn't even a conversation. Now it's, it's in the news all the time. That's taken 30, 40 years of value shift, you know, a, a paradigm shift in, in, at a societal level. And, and rewilding is no different. So there are people that are that are mad keen on rewilding there are people that detest it there's everybody in between but i think the direction of travel is generally one towards a recognition that we all have we can't ignore this we can't put our fingers in our ears and just carry on so what does rewilding or ecological recovery or habitat restoration or whatever you want to call it what does that look like for me whether that's in a garden in Edinburgh, in a park in Glasgow, or at a you know a bigger state in the north of Scotland, um, I think those conversations are taking place. So it's really an interesting um, social process as much as a as, as a physical one. Does that answer your question? It does. It's it's interesting. I I would think that that would be a good area of study to understand exactly why 
those changes are taking place uh, yeah. because that can then be applied elsewhere uh, in areas that continue to have uh, more resistance. Yeah. yeah. One, one observation for you, uh, which may or may not be of use, uh, regarding the motivations of young people. I would commend to you some of the work of Jean Piaget, a Swiss uh, psychologist who observed that between the ages of 16 and 20, young people, particularly those who are more cognitively developed, uh, develop uh, what he referred to as a messianic phase of, of life where they're identifying themselves in relation to society and what their role and their purpose is and looking to around the world and identifying things that they find to be improperly done and looking for ways of improving the world through their own efforts. Uh, and I think uh, being able to identify that and properly challenge it or ch channel it by giving them the opportunities to do specific things to give meaning to that purpose in their life uh, could be quite valuable. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting, that is, and, and I think you're, you're absolutely right, and we're, we're doing quite a bit of work with other organisations on exactly that. What are, the, what are the buttons that need pressing or the levers that need pulling for that particular demographic that, that's going to resonate with them and give them, as you say, purpose and, and meaning? If I could just maybe go to the opposite end of the spectrum, because my, my, my journey in this actually started in the States um, with the Wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone in '95. Mm. And it's really, really interesting because I thought I was doing a story about wolves, but actually it turned out to be a story about people's attitudes towards wolves. And, and I think two things came to the fore across many, many, many interviews that I did um, with ranchers, with hunters, with scientists. Um, the first one was that, generally speaking, these are sweeping generalizations, but people, especially older people, are more resistant to change, especially if they feel that change is being done to them rather than with them or for them. And I think the other thing that percolated to the surface, and wolves were a symbol of this in many ways, was the loss of control. They felt that, ranchers felt that the control over their land, their custodianship of their land was being eroded by some remote you know, civil servant in, in, in Washington that knew nothing about their life and their values. And they felt as though their, their control, their sense of identity in many ways was being, was being taken away from them. So. It, in many ways, it wasn't about wolves. It was about what wolves symbolized to those different those different audiences. So all of this stuff, which is terribly complex, plays a role in in the the ability of organizations like ours to to move ecological recovery forward. So it's really, really interesting. Sorry, I, I digress. I would note that I believe that that was the same project that caused a river to change its course. Yeah. Yeah. By changing the habits of the deer, which I was thinking of as you were uh, describing that earlier, uh, by forcing them up on the mountainsides where they were less prey to the wolves and uh, where they had been uh, absolutely devastating the ecology down in, in the easy area for them to graze. Uh, once they were forced by the wolves up onto the mountainsides, the whole ecology changed. And as a result of that, the course of a river changed. Yeah. It's very interesting. Going back to the, the deer herds at Glen Shee, there's an organization, this is slightly confidential, but there's an organization at the moment that are doing exactly that or trying to replicate um, what we call the, the circle of fear. So you, you're right in that apex predators don't only eat deer or prey items, but they change their behavior. And there's a group of, of four or five folk that are effectively... <laughs> running around the hills at the back of Glen Shee, scaring the deer to, to, to try and encourage them to move from just one place where the grazing is good. I'm just trying to get them to behave more naturally so the, their impact is, is reduced. So I think, you know, some of these ecological principles that were, were very manifest at Yellowstone, as you allude to, um, they're starting to percolate outwards and, and be in practice. We haven't got any wolves, but we've got, you know, act actors that are effectively playing the role of wolves. So it's really interesting how people are starting to think about some of these issues. I'm, I'll be happy to let you have my coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the irony, of course, we, we, uh, you know, I suppose the, the equivalent of coyotes in Texas is, is wolves in, uh, sorry, foxes in Scotland. 
And one of the things that can control foxes is apex predators. So wolves eat coyotes, wolves eat foxes. Um, so yeah, again, in terms of restoring the completeness and functionality of those ecosystems, apex predators definitely do have a role in that for sure. I'm thinking about the, the biodiversity in Central Park here in, uh, in Central <laughs> New York City. We have some uh, captured um, owls that are that are now flying uh, flying free, uh, Flacco, um, which has caught the, the imagination of a lot of people. Look, I think it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, I, I think we could continue. And I'm sure we will continue. Um, as I mentioned, we, we we have recorded the session. Um, if it's okay with you, Peter, you know, we'll invite other members to to chime in, and if they have any points, um, you know, we, we'll sort of uh, uh, organize that and and, and perhaps uh, get those to you. But uh, no, it's been fascinating. Thank you so very much, and and for all the amazing work uh, that you and Scotland, the big picture or are doing um this is again the inaugural webinar for for our forum um very exciting and again i think uh, the conversation continues um but thank you so 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 much thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, yeah by all means fire any uh, uh, extra questions through to me at, 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 at however you want to do it but um yeah Wonderful. thanks for your time and uh, good luck guys thank you Thank you so much to everyone for participating. And thank you, Jim, for helping with all the technical and operational issues. Thanks. Cheers now. Bye. Bye.